People of faith have experienced tough spots in their lives. Persevering faith takes us on. We don't give up. We press on. We can do that because of promises made to us by someone we can trust. He promised us a good spot in the end. He promised to be with us in the tough spots. He promised and He is faithful. Because of who He is, I can have faith in God. Maybe we're in a car one day. We're driving along and we hit an uncomfortable situation. Maybe it's the heavy rain or maybe it's just fog. We have lost our reference. We cannot see far ahead or behind or out the side. We have no perspective about where we are. We don't know what the hazards may be. We don't know if someone is about to rear-end us or if we are about to run into something. Have you been there? You are about to lose your nerve. Very uncomfortable spot to be in. Dangerous even. What to do? Some people do lose their nerve and park the car. Someone has said that a saint's life is in the hands of God like a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. God is aiming at something and the saint cannot see it. And he stretches and strains. And every now and again the saint says, I cannot stand it anymore. God does not heed. He goes on stretching till his purpose is in sight, and then he lets fly. Trust yourself in God's hands, for you have need of patience just now. Maintain your relationship to Jesus Christ by the perseverance of faith. Charles Spurgeon, known as a prince of preachers, said, The faith which saves is not one single act done and ended on a certain day. It is an act of continued and persevered in throughout the entire life of man. Hebrews 6.11 says, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 10, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I, my soul has no pleasure in him. Our hero of faith today from Hebrews 11 is the patriarch Abraham. We looked last time at Noah and his visionary faith. Today's sermon is titled Persevering Faith. Persevering is related to obedience and patience. Obedience and patience are two outstanding qualities of the faith of Abraham. What can we learn from this faith of Abraham? What was outstanding about his faith? How can we imitate the faith that he possessed? This is lesson number 22 in our study through the book of Hebrews. Our study text is Hebrews 11, 8 to 19. You can access these study videos in two online locations on speakthegoodword.com or on my YouTube channel by searching Samuel Troyer. Let's read our study text today. Hebrews 11, 8 to 19, from the English Standard Version. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to, to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore one from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. 
These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeting, greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. This is God's word. Abraham started his life in Ur of the Chaldeans, God called him to leave his home and familiar surroundings to go to a country that he had never seen. Abraham obeyed. Abraham's father, Terah, went with the family group up to Haran. They stayed there until Terah died. Abraham and his nephew Lot continued on down to the land of Canaan, as outlined in the book of Genesis. Abraham and Lot later parted company. Abraham and his family lived in tents, moving about in the land of Canaan. Once during a famine, they spent time in Egypt. Abraham was buried in Shechem in the cave of Machpelah that he had promised that he had purchased a burial plot for his wife Sarah. Abraham lived a life of persevering faith. The first topic we want to talk about here today in this lesson on persevering faith is promises. Promises, so important to us uh, as believers, so important to Abraham back in the day. Promises. We know what promises are. They are a declaration of some future action or inaction, something that will happen in the future or not happen. Promises are only as valid as the one who makes the promise. Is he trustworthy? Is he capable of carrying it out? Our scriptural, scriptural tells us that Abraham saw God as both faithful and strong. God is all-powerful and able and willing to carry out what he has promised. God is really the only one that is completely faithful and all-powerful and being able to absolutely make good on promises. The promises to Abraham were three. Three major promises that Abraham received. First, it was the land promise. God told him he would give him a land that he would show him. Abraham had never seen this place. And Google Earth had not yet been invented. Psalm 105 says, O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant that he made with Abraham his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance, when they were few in number of little account and sojourners in it. Abraham did not personally receive the fulfillment of the land promise. He roamed as a stranger in the land that his descendants would, own, would one day inherit. He was a pilgrim in the promised land. God promised to give him the land. The complete fulfillment of that promise seems to be pending yet today. And we look forward to a time when, uh, in fact, that promise will be complete to the Israelite people. The ultimate fulfillment of this promise, even to Abram, was a city that has foundations that is in heaven itself. So the ultimate promise, the land promise, uh, would go on and include heaven. The second promise was the national promise, promise of a nation. God promised that from Abraham's descendants, he would make a great nation, descendants that were non-existent at this point. God delivered on that promise to Abraham when he set up the Israeli nation 
The fulfillment was far in the future as far as Abraham was concerned. Hebrews 11, verses 11 to 13 says, By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So that was the second major promise that that Abraham had received. It was a national promise, a nation that would come from him. The third one was a spiritual promise. Reading from Genesis 17, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Many nations would call Abraham father because of Jesus who would be born of his seed. So this was a spiritual promise, uh, having relating to his son Jesus who would be born way down in the future. We can call him also Father Abraham because as Christians we believe in Christ. Promises to believers. There are so many promises that we have as believers. A few of the promises I want to uh, enumerate here um, just as an example, if you will, of the promises that God has given to us as believers. Number one, our sins are forgiven. That's a great promise. Psalm 103, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens, high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love to those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. We deal with sin every day as believers. We're not sin-free. And uh, God has promised to forgive those sins. He won't remember them. He has removed them far as the east is from the west. The second promise that many of us as believers may focus on is eternal life in heaven. We're promised that. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We are promised eternal life in heaven. We're promised God's presence with us in the form of the Holy Spirit. John 14. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. He has promised us grace. Oh, I need that every day. God's grace. His unmerited favor, his enabling power. But he said to me, this is Paul speaking, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. There are many precious promises that God has given to us. Second Peter uh, one says, His divine power has granted us to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to, his, to us His precious and very great promises, so that through him, them you may be, become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire." We receive these promises and take them by faith. We are learning to know the one who gave them. He is faithful. He is able to carry them out. He will keep his promises to us. That faith helps us to persevere in life and death. So that's the first topic I want to look at today in our lesson is, is promises. 
great promises to Abraham, great promises to us. The next uh, area we want to focus on is that of obedience. This is what Abraham was known for. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. His obedience. Faith in God is validated by action. It makes it valid. It, it proves that it is valid. Because of his faith in God, Abraham obeyed. That it is really the only measure that we have of faith. James says that faith that is unproductive is not valid. That's not a valid faith if it doesn't produce. Does that faith, does that faith produce the one that we have? Abraham's faith was very productive. The question I need to ask myself when doubt is plaguing me as to my own sincerity is whether my faith produces action in my experience. True faith in God helps us to get an accurate picture of our standing before Him, of His love toward us, and of the truth of the Word. Abraham's obedience of faith had several qualities. The first is that it was immediate. Abraham's obedience of faith was immediate. He didn't mess around in leaving home. He didn't delay his trip to Mount Moriah to offer up his son Isaac. He just went immediately. And then it was active. His obedience of faith was active. And uh, that, that tells us that it was genuine. I, read, I want to read a passage of Scripture to you from James 2 about active faith. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and, and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well, even the demons believe, and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his work. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The same way also... Was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So faith, Abraham's obedience of faith was immediate, it was active, and it was submissive. It was submissive to God's plan, leaving home. He may not have wanted to at all. It was uh, the act of circumcision was at, he was asked in, and he submitted to that. The sacrifice of Isaac, which was a huge test of his faith. Um, listen to Paul's testimony when he was describing his salvation experience to King Agrippa. He says, so then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. So that faith produces obedience. If it doesn't produce obedience in our lives, it's not real faith. It's not genuine. We prove the genuineness of our faith by our obedience. The third um, area that we want to discuss about uh, persevering faith is patience. As you can see, patience is very much related to persevering faith. Arturo Kinch of Costa Rica is a competitive cross-country skier and a former missionary kid who hadn't even seen snow until he was 19. He's a cross-country skier who trained for the Olympics in 2002. That's quite some time ago. Seems that Arturo, a Costa Rican man from the tropics, is somewhat of a folk hero in Norway. It happened this way. Years ago, when Arturo was just beginning to enter the world of ski com competitions, he raced in the famed Hollenkollen Ski Festival's 50-kilometer event in Norway. It didn't go so well. 
Partway into the race, he fell and broke his tailbone, but he continued on, determined not to quit. As the winters breezed through in about two and a half hours, Art was still struggling away on the course, trying to finish in just under five hours. In the Holland Colon, the King of Norway sits in a special box in the middle of the stadium. The winners of the race get to approach the box and shake the hand of the king. In that year's race, the winners had long ago finished, met the king, and put their warm, dry clothes on. The king of Norway, though, he decided to pay his respects for the hapless skier from Costa Rica who was giving his all that day. The king remained in his box, waiting patiently for Arturo. Because of this, none of the over 60,000 spectators in attendance had dared leave the stadium either. When Arturo Fale came into the stadium, he'd assumed everyone would have left, the banners would be taken down, etc. Though absolutely exhausted, delirious, and somewhat confused, Arturo heard the most unbelievably loud cheer from this massive crowd when he entered the stadium. So too will be our entrance into heaven for those that persevere, those who have the patience of faith. You may not be a champion in the world's eyes, but Jesus is waiting for you to give you the well done, good and faithful servant to those that finish in faith. Abraham waited, our hero of faith from Hebrews 11. Abraham waited. One of the outstanding characteristics of Abraham's faith was his patience, his perseverance. Twenty-five years it took for God's promise of a son to materialize. Twenty-five years of waiting, from being a healthy 75-year-old man to a 99-year-old, waiting and waiting, going out at night and looking at the stars and remembering God's promise that his descendants would be as numerous as those. He never did get to put down foundations and build a house. He was willing to live in tents on God's promise of a future inheritance. Abraham struggled. At times, he struggled. Particularly, he struggled with patience. There was Hagar. We know that story and Ishmael that resulted along with the Arab problems that continue to this day in the Middle East. God's promises, God's purposes are not accomplished overnight. It is a process that takes time. Delays are a fact of life. J.C. Philpott, he was a 19th century contemporary of Charles Spurgeon, shared this in a message. He said, Now patience is necessary in order to prove the genuineness and reality of faith. The Lord generally, I may say invariably, does not accomplish his purposes at once. He usually, I might say almost invariably, works by gradua- graduations. It's not that not is not this the case in creation? Do we do we see the oak starting out up in all its gigantic proportion in one day? Is not a tiny acorn committed to the ground, and and is not the giant oak whose huge limbs we admire the growth of a century? Men and women are years growing up to their full stature. Reading from Hebrews 10, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Lamentation 3 says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We have need of patience to finish. Oh, how we need the patience of faith to run the race that we are in. It's not a sprint. It's not a stroll in the park. It's a hard, long race. 
Sometimes we, it can get awfully lonely running our race. Each of us has our own set of handicaps to deal with. We cannot see our way clearly. We keep experiencing setbacks. We have need of patience to persevere. We need the patience of faith. And we can claim the promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to. To endure it. The final concept that I want to take from this passage in Hebrews is that of pilgrimage. It's not a word you hear bandied around a lot today. Pilgrimage. Abraham was a pilgrim. A pilgrim is one who journeys in a foreign country. He's not at home yet. He keeps on traveling and doesn't put down roots. In the foreword of his book, Inside Out, Larry Crabb writes this, Modern Christianity, in dramatic reversal of its biblical form, promises to relieve the pain of living in a fallen world. The message, whether it's from fundamentalists requiring us to live by a favored set of rules or from charismatics urging deeper surrender to the Spirit's power, is too often the same. The promise of bliss for now. Complete satisfaction can be ours this side of heaven. The effect of such teaching, continues Crabb, is to blunt the painful reality of what it's like to live as part of an imperfect and sometimes evil community. We learn to pretend that we feel now what we cannot feel until heaven. Beneath the surface of everyone's life, especially the more mature, is an ache that will not go away. It can be ignored, disguised, mislabeled, or submerged by a torrent of activity, but it will not disappear. And for good reason, we were designed to enjoy a better world than this. And until that better world comes along, we will groan for what we do not have. An aching soul is evidence not of neurosis, neurosis or spiritual maturity, but of realism. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as his inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Christians are pilgrims. As Christians, we are called upon to live the life of a pilgrim also. This flies in the face of the nominal Christianity teaching of today. That of taking ownership of our communities and their laws and politics. That teaching that Christianity will bring you prosperity here and now. That you can have your cake and eat it too. God has prospered some of you in a material sense. Be grateful for his provision. Use it for his glory. Our focus and priority should not be on material prosperity in this life. We, we would do well to imitate the faith and lifestyle of Abraham in that our roots do not go deep here. We are citizens of another country. That is a heavenly country. We are temporary residents here. Frederick Brotherton Mayer was a Baptist pastor and evangelist in England in the late 19th century and early 20th century. He was a contemporary and friend of D.L. Moody. Reading a quote from F.B. Meyer, Abraham, The Obedience of Faith, he says, that Sometimes pilgrims hang out in caves, but usually not. But very often they are to be found in the marketplaces and homes of men, distinguished only by their simpler dress, their girded loins, their restrained and abstemious appetite, their loose hold on gold. 
their independence of the maxims and opinions and applause of the world around, and the faraway look which now and again gleams in their eyes, the certain evidence of affection centered not on the transitory things of time and earth, but on those eternal realities which, lying beneath the veil of the visible, are only revealed to faith. These are the pilgrims. For them, the annoyances and trials of life are not so crushing or so difficult to bear because such things as these cannot touch their true treasure or affect their real interest. There are three things that pilgrims practice, three things that stand out on this issue of Abraham and his pilgrim status, three things that should be a part of our lives as pilgrims here. First, it's the tent Abraham lived in a tent. A tent is very impermanent. A tent is designed to be moved. Then there is the altar. Often when Abraham reached a new location, he would build an altar. Abraham worshipped where God took him. He was where God wanted him. And that's the best foundation of worship, actually. And then there is the view, number three, the promises. Going outside and looking at the stars, claiming God's promises. Abram kept looking toward the future and the promises of God. He looked for a city that has foundations, that is, a heavenly city. We also, we also, God help us to keep the tent, the altar, and the view. Okay, I want to recap our study just a bit now. Abram demonstrated a faith that persevered. What made that possible for him and for us? By faith, claiming the promises that God had given, stepping out in obedience, not giving up when we are waiting, being patient and allowing God to work, living as pilgrims on earth, looking forward to the day when we can go home. I hope you've enjoyed this study, and I wish you God's blessing today.